gave me oh uh okay now we're on <laughs> i think sorry <laughs> Well, hi, good evening. I think we're live on Facebook now. I don't Krista see it. Taking either. care of us. I don't see it either. Oh, here it oh, is. Here we go. I see yeah, it. Okay. Got yeah. it. Okay, I'll start it again. <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. As you're dropping in, uh, it's time for our exciting second book club where we're going to discuss the book of lost names. And we're very excited to have Kristen Harmel here, who also got us live on Facebook. So yay, thank you. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Brenda Gardner from South Carolina. And my co-host, thanks to uh, Zoom, is... Michelle Marcus, uh, hello from New York. <laughs> and tonight we're discussing the book of lost names with uh, New York Times bestselling author Kristen Harmel. So everybody, we're going to get into questions for our book club in a few minutes, but let me first introduce um, Kristen for you. She's the author of not only the book of lost names, but The Winemaker's Wife and a dozen other novels that have been translated and sold around the world. A former reporter for People magazine, Kristen began writing professionally at the age of 16 as a sports writer covering Major League Baseball and NHL hockey, which is just amazing. <laughs> um, the Book of Lost Names, our topic tonight, hit the New York Times bestseller list just recently, I think two weeks ago, and was just an international hit with uh, number one placement in the Toronto Star. So even though we know Kristen best as one of our Fab Five in the Friends in Fiction, she is an international bestseller, and she's brightened our Wednesday nights during this pandemic life. So welcome to you, Kristen. Thank you. Thanks welcome. so much for having me. Thank you. And I'm so happy to see what the two of you have done with this book club. It's been going so well. So thank you, and congratulations. You're doing such a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want me to start talking about the book of lost names or did you have some more announcements um, to make? I'll, I'll say one more thing and then uh, then continue if you're having a synopsis, but I'll just say one more thing quickly. Um, Kristen is known for her compelling, memorable, um, bittersweet books with strong um, and brave heroines who risk their lives to help save others' need. I read a few of her wonderful books and I'm looking forward to read more. I know that some people, unfortunately, haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but I was wondering if you could please give us a quick synopsis of the Book of Lost Names. Sure, absolutely, yeah. And I know we had said we would try to avoid spoilers for the first portion of our chat tonight, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I know, unfortunately, it's it's uh, driving me crazy, but the book is still out of stock in a lot of places. It should be fully back in by the middle of next week, which I'm yeah, next week, which I'm thrilled about. Um, but in, this, in, in case someone hasn't been able to get their hands on it yet, we'll save that for like the last, or try to save it for about the last 15 minutes, right, ladies? Is that, right. Is that kind of the plan? All right, cool. So um, the Book of Lost Names, my little brief elevator pitch, although it's a little bit of a long elevator ride. So this is the Book of Lost Names. Um, it is the story of a female forger in World War II who finds her way into the French resistance mostly by accident and winds up helping save the lives of hundreds of children. So she's a graduate student working at the Sorbonne Library in Paris when her father, who was born in Poland and is Jewish, is arrested. So she and her mother, also a Polish-born uh, Polish Jew, are also on a list for deportation, but they're out of the apartment and so they don't get arrested. Um, and then they flee using hastily falsified documents. So they wind up in a small French mountain town in the unoccupied zone where a priest working for a local resistance network finds out about her false papers, approaches her and offers her help in getting her father out of the detention center where he's being held in exchange for helping him with some false documents. So she reluctantly agrees and soon she meets Remy, who's another forger. Um, they kind of have like a little bit of a push pull kind of relationship. He has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder and he takes her on as like his assistant. Um, but it turns out she actually is a little bit naturally better at this than mm -hmm. he is. So, um, as they work together, she becomes passionate, not just about saving the children who they're falsifying documents for, but also about preserving their real identities, especially those who are too young to remember who they really are once their names have been changed. So they decide to begin encoding those identities in a 1732 religious text, which they begin referring to as the Book of Lost Names, hence the mm -hmm. title. 
It's actually a very easy book to title. The book I'm working on now, we have no title. So I wish I had an easy one for the next one. Oh. Um, anyhow, I'm so so curious. curious. I know. Ah, I'm curious too yeah. what the book is going to be called. Um, <laughs> So toward the end of the war, um, after their resistance cell is blown and Remy disappears, the Book of Lost Names goes missing too, and uh, possibly looted by the Nazis as they pull out of France. And then 60 years <laughs> later, Eve is a librarian <laughs> working in Newport, Florida, and she happens to see the book in, the, in a New York Times article that's about Nazi looted books, like books the Nazis stole during the war, and the search to return them to their rightful owners. So as the story unfolds in the past, we also see Ava, the main character in the present, trying to summon her courage to go to Berlin to see if she can find the Book of Lost Names and to see if it holds this last secret that she's been waiting for, for basically her entire life. So that's my very long elevator pitch for the Book of Lost Names. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, and it's so, the, in, the introduction to this book is just amazing. It had me from the get-go. But um, I wanted to ask, Kristen, I've read that your favorite stories that you did for People Magazine were the Heroes Among Us stories, Yeah. Um, tales of ordinary people doing extraordinary things, and that's certainly true of this book. Um, and I just was struck by the way your novels managed to capture a powerful historical event and put them into personal context for people and make them impact, impactful and meaningful. Mm -hmm. So how do you balance the historical fact with the compelling story to make it real for, for readers? Oh, that's a great question. Um, that is a great question. Yeah, it really is, Brenda. Thank you. Um, okay, so I guess in the writing process, I come up with the premise first, which is based on historical fact. And then when I have, once I have kind of the idea for the premise, like for this one, it was, I wanted to write about forgers and I wanted to write about lost books, uh, new, uh, like loot, looted books, the books the uh, Nazis had taken. So I did some very broad research into both things until I knew I had enough to work with. And the story I had in mind kind of took some different twists and turns. Um, Bre Brenda's outraged. She's like, no, I'm leaving. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so it, it, this, the story, <laughs> just teasing you, Brenda. Um, so the story kind of takes some twists and turns while, while I'm doing the research. But, I, but by the time I finish that, I have a very broad knowledge base about what I'm going to write about. Then I take the time to sit down and just dig into the story and dig into the characters. And I think that's what makes it, I hope, I mean, if I'm, if I'm doing it right, makes it a compelling story because I'm writing the story um, with all the historical facts at the back of my mind, but I'm really trying my hardest to focus on like what would make it a good story to draw you into and a good adventure or whatever. And then on uh, as I'm, so I do that like outlining. And then as I start to write, I begin to plug more of the historical details in and look up things that I don't know or, or that I had a vague idea about, but that I need a more defined idea about. So I think it's that combination of doing a lot of big research then nailing down the characters and the storyline, and then doing a lot of small research to make the world and the fabric of the world really come alive. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Oh, but Brenda, it, it, you're muted still. I'm muted? Sorry, oh, my dogs are. were quiet no, no, no. all afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I said, yes, that does make sense. And it's amazing. Just, just in the last 24 hours, I just wanted to share this before M Michelle asked you the uh, first advanced question. Um, we had several people on Facebook who were making comments like uh, Lisa Harrison says uh, your work was a masterpiece. Oh, wow. Uh, Yvonne hey. Murray said it's the best book I've ever read. Kathleen wow. Kilmarks, it was my favorite, said because I love this word and I don't ever hear it is she was gobsmacked. <laughs> and Cindy Kovach said, thanks for bringing attention to the greatest generation. Oh, oh it's, 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 touched, it's touched a lot of people. So we are grateful to you for that. Oh, thank you. Thanks for sharing that with me. And thank you all out there for saying such kind things about it. You know, it's been, um, I mean, Friends in Fiction and the Friends in Fiction Book Club have just been say, such great gifts to us these past few months. Um, you know, because as a writer, even even minus the pandemic, 
you kind of feel like you're writing in isolation or writing in a vacuum or, you know, you only kind of venture out when you have a new book out. And so that's the only time you really get to interact with readers, but this is letting us interact with readers and friends all the time. It's, it's been, um, it's just been so nice for me as both a person and a writer. It's such a gift and so nice to hear nice comments like that. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, fabulous. I think Michelle has uh, our first advanced question. Thank you. I just want to also add that, you know, I really felt very passionate about this book too. And I love all the support that you're getting from all our readers about this as well. All right. So what I'm going to um, say is we had some readers who shared some questions in advance. Uh, we're going to be um, sharing a few of them tonight. So we're going to start with one of them now. But if you have a question that you didn't get a chance to ask before, you could add it in our chat box now. So I will go to the first question. Um, please be patient with me if I get your name wrong. I really apologize. Um, it was from Laura Fideli Vicio. She said, while I know the concept was based on true events, forges during the Holocaust, uh, were uh, specific people actually combined to create the character Ava? Uh, that is a great question. Oh, I'm sorry, was that it? Did I cut you off? Sorry, Michelle. No, was, no, that's it. That's the okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> Sometimes I over talk and I'm like, oh, sorry. No, um, no problem. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, excellent question. Um, so the character of Ava um, was, came from my imagination, but the way that she does the forgeries and the way she's involved with resistance networks was very much based on um, some real people and some real networks throughout France. So the two primary forgers that I based her story and her skills on were um, Adolfo Kaminsky, who was a very prolific forger in Paris, and um, Oscar Rizowski, who was a very prolific forger in um, the, uh, the southern part of France. Um, they both were young Jewish men. Um, and as you know, if you've read the book, um, Ava is a young Jewish woman. Um, they both kind of found their way into forgery by accident. Um, they both had backgrounds that led them sort of naturally into some element of the forgery, but not backgrounds you would think of. So for example, just like Remy in the novel, um, Adolfo Kaminsky, the Parisian uh, forger, actually had a background in chemistry. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the methods they use were actually his methods. Methods. So, for example, um, in the novel, one of the things that Remy knows how to do is erase Waterman's blue ink mm -hmm. by using lactic acid. That was actually something that Adolfo Kaminsky discovered because he had worked for a dairy farmer um, or, or a uh, like a dairy farming conglomerate mm -hmm. and bought cream from dairy farmers and dairy farmers were trying to water down the cream. So he devised um, a method of dissolving Waterman's blue ink. Uh, in the cream to see what the fat content was. So like, that's how he knew about the lactic acid, which, so there were like little interesting tidbits like that that became part of these characters. But the actual personality and heart of the characters was more from my own imagination. But um, I should also add though, that the way the resistance network worked um, was based loosely on the way that the network that, um, Oscar Rosowski was a part of. So Oscar, Oscar Rosowski was the one who worked in an area called the Plateau that was just like the book, the town the book takes place in, um, very isolated, not a strategic place for the Nazis. You know, there weren't that many of them there. And so it became a good place to hide children and eventually to take children, hopefully to Switzerland. So, um, so those elements of the book were based on those real life pieces. Very good. Wow, that's that's amazing. I know a lot of people with who are history buffs have enjoyed that realistic aspect. Okay, this is going to be a question for everyone to comment on in the chat box um, with each other and us. And so I wanted to ask you, the readers, trust is a big theme in this book. Ava and her mother were forced to trust certain people along the way with their secrets. As readers, were you concerned about the truth the trust they were placing in people. And then while they're responding, Kristen, if you have any thoughts about how it how it played into your greater theme, you could certainly share that with us and, and we'll try to get those comments. Yeah, so if there's any comments, I will read them. Well, that's such an interesting question about trust. Um, you know, I, I think when you're in the midst of a situation like Ava, and her mother were in the midst of, and, and Remy, uh, and, and the priest and everybody, um, you have to put trust in people. I mean, you, you don't have a choice. And um, the problem is 
the people who who you need to put your trust in aren't always clear, if that makes sense. Um, and so just because somebody's wearing the right uniform or just because somebody has the right nationality or whatever doesn't necessarily uh, mean they're trustworthy. I mean, there, there were many cases in France, uh, I mean, many, many, many cases of um, French citizens who, uh, who basically informed upon people who were in the resistance. So, you know, you would think you could trust them because they were supposedly on your side, right? I mean, they were French and whatever, but, um, you know, not necessarily in this book, but I mean, that was really something that was very, very common. So, you know, your neighbor would betray you for the price of, you know, a few packs of cigarettes and some extra ration tickets or whatever. So, um, mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's, I think it's hard to know who to trust and if you put your trust in the wrong people, um, you can wind up in a really terrible situation. Right. I'll share a few thoughts or, um, from our readers who are here um, tonight. Um, Sylvia Sarrow King said, I think they had no choice but to trust some. Yeah, I guess you're in a situation where you have to find people to trust. And Mary Nelson Canstra, I'm not sure if I pronounced your name right, I wondered how they decided to trust the woman who ran the boarding house as well as the others they met there. And That's someone else said, Patty Lynn, I don't, I feel like the mother did not trust anyone, hated the way she treated Ava. Well, you know what, can I actually, can I, can I mention something about the mom? Because I feel like that's sure. something that I get a, Definitely. Um, Definitely. I, you know, I get a lot of questions about the mom. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I think that it, the that is probably the number one negative thing people say to me about this book. Like I hated the mom, or I didn't really like the mom, or you know whatever. Yeah. Um, I think the mom is really real, um, and and I don't think you're supposed to think like, boy, that's a, you know that that's a really fantastic character. I think you're just supposed to think she's she's real. She's a real character, and she's someone who, in my mind, her life was very small and that was fine. She had this little world that she was comfortable with. She had her husband, she had her child. Um, she was in, an immigrant to France. Um, she kind of lived like an isolated life. She didn't have a job outside of the house. I mean, I think she worked part-time, but I, if I'm remembering right, she took clothes in or something, but um, she didn't have a whole lot of interaction with other than just a very small circle of people. Um, and so when that world is blown apart, I think she doesn't know what to do. Her husband is taken. That's the center of her life, the core of her life. And now the only thing she has left is her daughter. And all she sees is her daughter let her husband be taken. And now her daughter is doing things that might get the two of them arrested too. Um, so she's very angry, I think, because she feels like she has completely lost control. And I think that's a really common psychological reaction if you feel a complete loss of control. Um, it, I, different people react different ways, but I think it would not be uncommon to react with just anger at everybody and at the world and at, mm -hmm. at, at everything that's going on and everything you can't control. And then to add insult to injury, the daughter keeps going against her advice, which is putting her in more danger. And so all she can see, she's not seeing what's being, what might be gained. She's seeing what's being lost. And then on top of that, she feels like her daughter is throwing away the thing that makes them them, which to her is her Judaism. Okay. That's that's what the, the mm -hmm. mother feels. Um, Whereas I think Ava feels like, yes, that's an important part of her, you know, an important part of who I am. But right now we're all humans working together. And, and that's not, that was like not at the forefront of what she was thinking. So I think it just, they were very different people on very different paths and Ava moved forward and grew and her mother stayed in place. So that's my explanation for the mother and why she didn't trust anybody. I think it comes from a place of love and a place of fear. Um, in a place of not having any control over the world around her. So that's that's my that's yeah. my defense of the mother. <laughs> Who nobody seems to like. I'm so <laughs> well, but the comments we're getting um, from from readers in the chat box are, are very, you know, consistent with that. She was traumatized and she reacted in a very realistic way, as you said. Um, in fact, Judy Hines says the mom's skepticism and cynicism are very real, especially in her out of control situation where she couldn't. Oh, thank control you. Anything oh, thank else. you. Yep, that's exactly what I was going for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and you know what? I feel like a, a war novel where everybody rises up and does the right thing it wouldn't be realistic because that's not that's not what we all do in, in situations like that. You know what I mean? And we all have different reactions for different reasons that are, you know, largely based on our situation in life and where we come from and where we're going and all, you know, all, all of those things. So um, 
Uh, although she per perhaps was not a super lovable character, I, I loved her because I think I think she was trying to do the right thing by the people she loved and she just didn't know how. Mm -hmm. And I think people felt for her as well. Both of them were trying in their own way, you yeah. know, um, but they were just very at odds. Yeah. All right, Michelle, you had a question. Okay, okay so the next question is, um, readers, how did you feel about Ava not telling her son about his secret life during the war? And why do you think she did this? And while they were answering Kristen, why did you make the choice have Ava not tell her son the secret? So uh, that's a great question. Um, I think in, okay, so in my mind, people have different um, psychological reactions to trauma, like we were just talking about, about the mother. Um, and what Ava went through was incredibly traumatic. Um, not just, I, I mean, you know, it, her story could have stopped after her father's arrest in Paris, and that would be reason enough to be traumatized, you know, 65 years later, 60 years later, whatever. Um, but as her story continues, there are some awful things that happen to her. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoil them for anyone who hasn't read the book, but there are things that she loses and things she blames herself for. Um, and, and I think it's those things that she blames herself for that are the things she can't get over. Um, and so she's never able to look at herself as someone deserving of praise. Um, she looks at herself as someone who's ashamed. I mean, she's, she's ashamed of these decisions she made that as far as she knows were the things that led other people to their doom, basically. Um, and, and, um, and I think she's carried that guilt with her all these years. And it, it's, I don't think it's an uncommon reaction for people who have gone through something like that and who, and who feel that way about it to try to disappear into a fictionalized version of who they are, as opposed to moving through and for, through, through the, through the psychological pain and forward, if that makes sense. And so um, I think Ava just never dealt with it. I think Ava um, got married and basically just took it, embraced this opportunity for a new life on a new continent that would leave her old life and her old world behind. And when she made that choice, there was a, there was a very um, sharp division between the past Ava and, and the present Ava moving forward. And I think that to have opened that door and shared those things with her son would have been to undo all the, all the bandages, the false bandages she had put mm -hmm. over the wounds over, over right. the, the years. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And I tell you, uh, one of our um, listeners, Pam, and it scrolled past me, so I apologize, but Pam said that was typical and very true of people who had gone through World War II, and they just didn't talk about it. My, my dad, for one, was in World War II at Normandy, and he never talked about it. Um, to, you know, so yeah. be it citizen or military, I think that was just like you said, a coping mechanism. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And a, and a coping mechanism that was very, um, like you said, very common in that generation. That wasn't a generation where you came home and talked about your feelings. You know what I mean? Like that was a generation where you just kind of stuffed it inside. And, and I mean, certainly not everybody, but, but I think talking about our feelings and facing our demons is a lot more common today, you know, than, than it was 75 years ago, you know? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, let's see, I'm going to, Michelle, should I go on to the next question? What, did you see any? Um, <laughs> give Kristen. Well, I was saying that it's common for, P, uh, someone said common for PTSD, uh, Rebecca said that, and, and Anne said she didn't want to put the burden on her son. Yeah, and, that's a good point. Yeah, like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if you want to continue now. Okay, um, thanks. Um, yeah, we're springing all these questions on Chris. <laughs> no, they're great. I was actually just thinking the next time there's a break in the in the questions, I need to say you guys have great questions. I mean, you know, I, I you. do I, like you're really you're really delving deep into things and I 
completely appreciate that. Thank you. I, I was just thinking like, gosh, I need to have you write the questions for the show now. Like our, like our Wednesday <laughs> night show. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Kristen. Um, so here's, here's another sort of um, character question. Um, since we've been talking about so much about Ava, um, do you think she settled for her husband, Lewis? And I don't think this is a spoiler because that happened really early in the book. And was she right to do so? Um, did she have to marry someone else in order to separate her life? I, I think I think that's what it was. Um, I, I think, um, I mean, are we ever right to marry someone who we know we're never going to love the way we're supposed to? No, probably not. I mean, and I would like to think that she loved him. It just wasn't the great, it wasn't a great love of her life. You know what I mean? But he was... Um, I think he was a way out and, and not, not in a, not in a, not in a way that she looked at them and thought like, bam, that's my ticket to America. But I think he was someone who she liked. I think he was someone she had a lot in common with. Um, I think quite importantly, he was someone her mother would have approved of, um, which uh, I think probably was something that, that, um, that shaped her decision uh, and somebody her father probably would have approved of. Um, and, and I think she had just come from making all her own decisions and feeling that it had ended disastrously. And so here was somebody who was safe. Here was somebody who would take care of her. Here was someone who loved books and like, you know, had some things in common with her and who was offering her a chance to start over. Um, and so I think I mean, of course we can say maybe that wasn't the right choice, but maybe it was because maybe she wouldn't have survived otherwise. You know what I mean? Like maybe, maybe she wouldn't have been able, maybe left in France, she would have, she wouldn't have been able to deal with her ghosts or she wouldn't have been able to move on and have any kind of a life. It's, it's hard to know. I mean, I don't know. It's a good question. Well, let's see what our readers say. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> I'm saying our readers as if I have any, you know, responsibility. No, <laughs> um, you know, like Mary and Barbara were just saying it was a way for her to move on, have a new start. And same thing with Pam not living in the past. Yeah. So I think a lot of that um, reflected into her decision. That's what our readers have been saying as well. That's good. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in life, we all make decisions that aren't, that aren't the purest, best ones. You know what I mean? Like, and obviously that, that's a, that's a huge decision to make because it's one that shapes the rest of your life. And I, I hope we're not all out there making decisions like that, but like, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, li life is full of gray areas where there's no absolute right or no absolute wrong, you know? And it, I don't know, it's, it's kind of what you do in that messy sticky gray area in between that defines you absolutely okay so we'll move on to the next question our readers how do you feel Ava handled the situation when her father was arrested by the Nazis do you think she could have done more than uh, more than or even after to help him and Kristen what were we trying to demonstrate about Ava in that scene well what was I trying to demonstrate about Ava that's a great <laughs> question um, I mean, my opinion is that she probably couldn't have done more. I mean, cause all, all that would have happened is she and her mother would have gotten arrested too. I, I think, yeah. is that okay? Am I answering the one that's for the readers or, or can I answer that? Is that okay? Is that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. We want your insight and oh, okay. we'll go over what <laughs> some of the comments are. All right. So so I, I think I think the the mother was was not rational to blame Ava for letting her father get arrested. Mm -hmm. I think the the blame, which still wasn't blame, but I think the the it was more rational for Ava to blame herself for not trying harder to persuade her father that there was trouble coming. Because remember mm -hmm. she she brought home the message from Joseph saying you know, there's, there's, there's a roundup of Jews happening. And the father basically just said, you know what, we get messages like that all the time. And here's one of them. And, you know, it's, it's not real. And I think that was sort of the prevailing sentiment at the time. Um, a, a lot of people did receive warning and, um, and thought that's not going to happen. And then it did. And then after that, you know, people, knew a lot more and, and knew to play it safe. But that first roundup of over 13,000 people 
happens like that. I, and, and no one believed that. I mean, it was actually supposed to be much larger than that. The roundup was supposed to be bigger. So a lot of people did heed the warning and went underground or fled or, you know, went somewhere else, um, you know, to get away from it. But um, uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think Ava could have done anything in that moment when they watched him be arrested. And I don't think he would have wanted them to. I, I think, yeah. I think he, his greatest relief in that moment was probably that his wife and his daughter were safe. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I think so. We're getting some comments from the chat box. Lisa Harrison says, I think Ava did the best she could. It was tough for her to watch, but it would have ended badly if she had tried to interfere. And I'm, I'm kind of uh, assuming some things here, but as a reader, I felt like her father was probably terrified that she would do something. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to get a couple more comments. I'm not very quick on the draw. Um, Lori Brown says it was just heartbreaking that her mother um, blamed her. And then Suzanne says Ava would have basically sealed her and her mother's fate had she gone after her father. 100%. Yeah. Well, and, and I think Ava thought that. I think Ava thought the only chance I have of doing anything about this is not to get arrested, you know? Mm -hmm. So and that's absolutely the yeah. only way she would have been just taken yeah. and then they would all have been gone. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. That's what her father wanted to do to help yeah. take herself and her mother. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, and I, I don't think the mother was really angry at her for not stepping in. I mean, she said she was, and that was something she kept repeating, but I think it was the, the to me, it was the same way that, if you're 12 and your parents get divorced, you might lash out at the parent who, who you feel like isn't going to leave you. Do you know what I mean? Like, like you, mm -hmm. you, you just, you lash out at the wrong people or, or you, you lay your blame at the feet of the people that are, that are there and aren't going anywhere. Do you know what I mean? And so well, I, I, the I, safe I, I people. Mean, yep. The safe people. Yeah. Exactly. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have any other comments, Michelle. Um, I'm having a little trouble keeping up with the scrolling, but y'all keep the comments coming and we are going to take questions from the chat. Mostly the same thing. Uh, mostly saying the same thing about, about that. So, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead to the next question and I feel like we're just um, peppering you with questions, um, Kristen. <laughs> this is not... <laughs> And, and this is about, this is not, I don't think this is a spoiler either, but one of the really um, kind of uh, telling moments was when Ava goes to Drancy, the prison camp, and how the people there, um, French and the Germans, seem to be unmoved by the, the, the just horrors going on around them. And um, I wanted to ask people who'd read the book, how, how, what did you think of when you read that? How do people come to terms with themselves when they're in that situation? That's a great question. Yeah. D did you want me to give my opinion on that too? Yes, yes please. And I also the readers will give their opinion. Like, mm -hmm. what, what's that? What's that, Michelle? Sorry. Oh, and the readers also give their opinion at the same okay, time. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, it, in my mind, you'd have to find a way to live with yourself. And, and if you, if you find a way to live with yourself, you've somehow found a way to justify it. And so that, um, that seems impossible, but people justify things all the time. You know, people, um, I, I, I guarantee you a lot of the people out there committing crimes today aren't doing it feeling like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. They're, they've figured out a way to make it okay in their head. And I'm not talking about the people who are, you know, crazy and who are doing it out of, you know, some kind of unbalanced thought process. But, you know, people who embezzle from companies, for example, they're finding a way to rationalize it and, and you know, and make it okay in their hearts and their heads so that they can go ahead and do that. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, it's not the same thing, but I think that, um, I think that as um, human beings, unfortunately, in some cases, we have gr the great capacity to, um, to shift the details of the story to fit our narrative. And I mean, that really, if, if you think about it, that has a lot to do with how the Nazi party probably rose to power in the first place. I mean, when you think about all mm -hmm. the 
things that they were saying to people, the things they were asking people to do and the things they made people believe. Like, it's really hard to look back at that and say, how on earth were there so many people who followed that and who thought it was okay, but it was just consistent years and years and years of brainwashing, but really clever brainwashing that said, this is how to think and this is why to think that way. And this is why we're better. And this is why we have to keep other people down. And like, it was, and, and that, that thought process just got drilled into people's heads again and again and again. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, and, and look what happened. The Nazi party rose and we had world war two. And that was, how did any, how did anybody who followed that movement justify that to themselves? You know, it's hard, hard to imagine. Right. And what we don't know in the book, at least is what some of those people lived with when the war was over. So true. You know, yep. Um, we, we don't know that. Well, and oh. it's astonishing the number of um of French people. Uh, I, I mean, a lot of French people were part of the resistance or or did small things to resist on their own. But there were a lot of people who um who were collaborators. There, there were a lot of French people who um who said, you know what? I, I think the Germans are going to win here, so I'm just going to join their side or do what they want me to do or inform on people or you know, a, a lot of uh, a lot of police officers were happy to to do the Germans bidding. Um, and, and I think a lot of that was self-preservation. I think a lot of it was, I think this is the winning side. I think I want to be on it, you know? Okay, I'll give some of the thoughts from our, from our readers. Um, let me see. Okay. Some people, uh, their reaction was to become numb to justify it. Some people were just trying to stay alive. Some people they were saying were brainwashed, so they were saying, "Oh, yeah, they can justify because they're brainwashed." Um, some people had to remove their emotions to live with themselves. So, oh, so, sorry, some of the names it was Anissa who said had to remove their emotions, and Maui said they were coming numb to justify it. And um, let's see, um, survival instinct was what Rebecca said. That it was a survival instinct. Yes, oh. absolutely. And I, most people are agreeing, Kristen, with what you said about about the um, that pattern, you know, yeah. of of um, escalation. Yeah. One one on one light note about that question, and I and it scrolled past me, so I can't get the name. But someone said, "I'm agreeing with everything y'all say. I'm just nodding my head. Oh, <laughs> as, as if you can see me." <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was Judy that said that. Judy, okay. Yeah, Judy, that that's great. really funny. That lightened the mood. Like that coming, Judy. Thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we ready for our next question? Okay, so all right. So the next question has to do with a quote from the book. On page 370, Ava says, We aren't defined by the names we carry or the religion we practice or the nation whose flag flies over our heads. I know that now. We're defined by who we are in our hearts and who we choose to be on this earth. And how did this pertain to Ava's situation? So basically well, just, yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, how did that pertain to Ava's situation? Great question. Um, I think that was something Ava had to figure out for herself. So I think her mother, um, was very set on keeping her in the in the box that was comfortable and she'd probably spent her whole life in this box that was comfortable um and then the war and everything that happened kind of ripped off the sides of that cardboard box and here she is having to figure out how to define herself and one of the things that she and her mother particularly her mother um worried about was being er- erased uh, the mother's very harps a lot on you're erasing us, they're erasing us, everyone's erasing us. And that's something that I think Ava really takes to heart um, because she is technically erasing the names of these children, which is one reason why she starts keeping a record of their names, their real names. Um, But I think what she comes to realize, especially in some of those scenes where she's with the children, the hidden children um, in the town there, she comes to realize that it doesn't matter what their names are, like what name they're going by. There's, they're still who they are. Um, And I think a lesson that she learns in her interaction with, um, with Remy and with the priest is that um, I think we're humans before anything else. So they're, they're not Jewish like she is. She's not Catholic like they are. 
Um, but they're all human together. And that was, um, that was the most important thing. And I think that becomes a huge piece of her journey to figure that out, that it's not about, it's not about religion. And just by loving or caring about somebody who's of a different faith than you or a different nationality than you, or that that doesn't erase who you are. It it's just, it's just another human. It's just another human you love or care about or want to help. Um, and, and I think that in figuring out that that's not the same, that, that, that loving someone isn't the same as erasing who you are. I, I think that was crucial to, to who she became and who she, you know, who she, um, who she was going to be in life. And that kind of, um, that actually ties back to, it's so funny, you were saying before we went on tonight that like, if somebody asked me a question about The Sweetness of Forgetting, which was my 2012 novel, I would be like, I don't know, I wrote that a decade ago, but now I'm gonna cite my own 2012 novel and say, <laughs> and um, in, in that book, that was kind of, that was one of the storylines. And I always, I was happy to kind of come back to that a little bit here. Um, that book told the true story of, uh, or was based loosely on the true story of the Muslims of the Grand Mosque of Paris, saving around a thousand Jews during World War II. So think about that. Muslims of the Gra Grand Mosque mm -hmm. of Paris mm -hmm. worked with Christian organizations and saved Jewish people. It was all three or all, all three religions working hand in hand because it didn't matter. It didn't matter how they found God. What mattered was that they were all humans facing evil together. And I feel like that was kind of something um, that uh, that was a thread that ran through this book also, and, and that Ava really has to learn in order to become who she needs to be. Did I answer the question? I feel like sometimes I just go off on these tangents and I'm like, I don't even, where did I even begin? I don't oh, know. It's so, it's so amazing. <laughs> it's so amazing, no. And I, I'm going to have to ask, I'm sorry, Michelle, I, the, the comments are scrolling past me. So I'm going to um, ask you if you will kind of summarize some of them. But that is, that was unbelievable, really, Kristen. <laughs> um, the, the context of that story and, and the way you just explained it, I know several readers were saying, I just think that is an amazing um, you know, way to put it um, you know, and, um, and to look yeah. at it. Frankly, um, it's amazing. Amazing, I can string words together after 7 p.m. Honestly, I don't know how I, I don't know how I'm doing it, or, or, or do it every Wednesday. This is like it's all a small miracle. <laughs> That's funny. I, I do see one. Marilyn Rumpf says, "I love how you show the strength of community in this novel, and really, even with everything else going on, there's an incredible amount of, you know, cohesion and strength." Well, thank you, thank you for saying that. That's funny. That isn't actually something I've um. I've really thought much about before, but that th there did need to be that kind of community for this story to unfold. And that that aspect, I think, was very much based on um, that area I mentioned called the plateau, which if you're interested in reading more about that, there's a book called A Good Place to Hide, which is a nonfiction book um, that talks about the activity, the resistance activity on, on the plateau in that area. Um, but the the community was very strong there too, and and you need a community where um, where there are a lot of people working toward the same cause um, to to be able to do the kinds of things they did. You know what I mean? To be able to shelter the children, to be able to keep quiet about the children, to be able to um, to falsify these documents, and then to be able to send those children on their way. So uh, yeah, the the community is important. That was a, a very good point. Wonderful. Did you Thank want you. me to share any more comments? Well, we probably need to. I'm looking. At, this time has just flown by. It's already oh seven. Yeah. We were going to reserve the last 15 minutes for for really for spoilers. <laughs> so um, if there's yeah. any comments that are spoilers, I think we're probably open game for that now. If Kristen is good. Um, and, and, you know, we can just say that if people haven't um, haven't finished reading the book and yes don't want the spoilers, they can always watch the end of this video later, right? Because it'll still be up on the the page. Sure, yeah, and definitely. They can, they can watch they can, it anytime. Exactly. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. And, and again, the book should be back in stock everywhere by the middle of next week. So if you're having trouble finding it, you know, my um, my bookstore still has it. Uh, the, or the one close to me, Writer's Block, still has it. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. at 20% off, even though sometimes their webpage says they don't have it, they actually do. They have like a stack of 200 just sitting there. So it's still mm -hmm. available there. And then Copperfish, who's our seller of the week this week, um, I know they have it too, and they have it at 20% off. So 
Yeah, so it's good to know if you haven't been able to get it, don't give up. Try, try again now. If you go to those places, you'll get a discount. So there you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Fabulous. I, I know while there people are putting in their in their questions that we're going to um that Michelle's going to pick from, several people have asked about the artifacts that you used. And oh, could yeah. you, do you happen to have those handy? I do. It's like my favorite part of the do. Yeah. Show <laughs> <and tell. laughs> you, you have books. Everywhere. You have things tucked everywhere. I do. You, you should see, like, I know behind me it looks very organized, but if only I could, if I could turn this all around without, like, what, here, I'll probably mess this up, but look, this is like, I mean, it's just a mess. Like, it's like a disaster, but look, it's all this <laughs> sitting here, like, oh, yeah, this is my, yeah, not, not good work. But yet, wearing leggings, sitting cross-legged on my chair, yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, Exclusive. The, 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 yeah, the jig is up. I'm not, I'm really not that together. <laughs> Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, let's see. So, um, this is a, um, this was actually a really cool part of my research. I thought this was a Nazi issued travel permit. So, um, I know the light kind of disrupts being able to see it, but, um, it, this was what you would have needed to travel around France. Um, this is from the 2nd of December, 1940. You can see the heraldic Eagle stamp, the Nazi stamp. Mm -hmm. Um, the personal information of the gentleman who was traveling, um, the stamp of his organization permitting him to travel. This is exactly the kind of thing, and, and the, um, the instructions and the notes are all typed in German. So this was prepared by the Germans in Paris to give permission mm. to travel. So that's exactly the kind of thing forgers would have had to forge. It was a very common document to forge uh, because in order to travel anywhere around France, you had to have one of these. And um, if you were trying to get out of Paris, you obviously needed to travel somewhere around France. So that was a very, very, very common thing to forge. Um, another thing I have that I enjoy sharing is the Journal Officiel. It's the official government document of um, France. I believe it still comes out, although it might just be digitally now. It might just be an electronic um, journal. But um, this recorded every legal proceeding and naturalizations, marriages, divorces, property transfers, things like that, um, which made it an invaluable source of information or a, and, a, and a resource for stealing names. So forgers would take names from here because they were attached to real identities. And you could find somebody whose age, whose accent, whose general circumstances in life fit the person you were trying to conceal. Um, so this became a very common um, source for forged identities, the Journal Officiel. And this one is from um, June 28, 1944, but I have a whole stack of these from, from 1944, which is kind of cool. Um, and then my favorite thing to show is uh, the real book of lost names. So um, in the novel, the, um, the uh, book of lost names is a 1732 religious text. And within its pages, Ava and Remy uh, keep track of the children and send messages to each other in a code based on a mathematical sequence called the Fibonacci sequence. So that was fictional. That part was fictional. But this is the book I used as the basis for that. It's a real 1732 religious text. It's a guide to the weekly masses. So you would have found it very, very common in a um, just a rural French library, like the one they were, a rural French church library, like the one they were working in. And as I was doing the codes and describing the code, um, I was doing it on the actual pages. So I never marked in the book, but I would go to like, say page 163. And I would, you know, if I would describe them doing a star over one word and a dot over another, I was using the actual, um, the actual words in this book. So this became sort of my real book of lost names that I touched every day and thought, yes, this is my connection to the story. This is my connection to the past. Oh, it's so, funny you said that uh, someone named Jennifer Rose actually could explain the code a little bit. Sure. So it's it's actually really simple. It's, um, well, no, I shouldn't say it's simple because I know it sounds complicated and I went back and forth about like, how do I explain this? But um, the, so the Fibonacci sequence is um, you add the two previous numbers together to get the next number. So it starts off with one and then like zero plus one is one. So one, one, and then one and one is two. One and two is three. Two and three is five. Three and five is eight. Like, so it's it's the two previous numbers to get the next number. Um, and so that's how they did it. Um, and that was what the sequence of the pages was. So they used the Fibonacci sequence. Um, so, so they would start, so for example, 
the first person would be the first two letters of their name would be on page one and then the second mark on page one and then a mark on page two and then a mark on page three and then a mark on page five and then a mark on page eight and then a mark on page uh, whatever comes next, 13, whatever. So, um, so that's how it went. And then with each successive person, it was the Fibonacci sequence plus one. So you would take each of those numbers and then add a number to it. So it didn't alter the actual sequence. It was just, you started with that basic sequence for everybody and then just added a number. Like if like, say like the 14th person, you would add 14 to one, 14 to one, 14 to two, 14 to three, 14 to five, 14 to eight. 14 to 13. Does that, does that make sense? I, so, um, so that that's, I know, I know it's crazy, but then, sorry, that, the that's how it went off. I, I, yeah. And I, yeah, I, I yeah, that's it's too it. complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that, that's how it unfolded. And you would know somebody's name was beginning because the first, um, the first letter of, because obviously then as you get further into the numbers, there would be multiple marks on a page, but you knew a name was beginning. Um, because th that was a star. The beginning of somebody's name on their first page was always a star. Mm -hmm. And so knowing the Fibonacci sequence, you could go through with that person's name and do the entire name based on that, if that makes sense. So. It does. It does. I was yeah. sitting there trying to figure out, okay. I, <laughs> I, was going, I was going to put a whiteboard up and say, Kristen, you have to just. just I know. <laughs> right. I, have, yeah. I have to do like a, like a goodwill hunting scene where I like do all these like complicated <laughs> yeah, yeah. formulas and uh -huh. solve it to so, the awe of everybody. <laughs> yeah. We would be so impressed. <laughs> right. well, I, I know we only have a few minutes left, but I do um, wanted to get, I did want to get to some other questions that readers had or sure. participants had. Um, and I know that was a big one because that was expressed several times throughout the, um, <laughs> the session. And so now I'm going to go back and practice the Fibonacci sequence and <laughs> impress my friends. Right. Do you want me to pick a question? Oh, yes. I'm yeah. sorry, Michelle. I can't. It, it won't let me keep up with the question. She's doing okay. ancient duty. Going back to one we had earlier from Krista. Kristen, you talked earlier about outlining before you begin writing. With the Book of Lost Lanes, did you stray much from your original outline? Was the ending what you have planned from the beginning? Did the characters, as you wrote them, dictate, dictate plot changes at any point? If so, can you give an example? That's a good question. Um, yeah, very good. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah good, good question, Krista. Um, so... I think that the book stayed pretty true to the outline, but when I was writing the outline, I didn't know who the bad guy was going to be. And I can't remember if I like the one who betrays her. And I, I couldn't remember if I figured that out in the outline or in the first draft, but it was not clear to me from the beginning. So like when I was writing that character at the beginning, I wasn't writing it thinking this guy is going to turn out to be the bad guy. It just, as I was, I can't, I really can't remember if it was during the outline or during the actual, I, I should look back and see, because I still have the old outline. Um, I would say the biggest difference was that there were a lot more chapters in the present. I, I in The Winemaker's Wife, my previous book, I had written two chapters in the present. I mean, two chapters in the past, one in the present, two in the past, one in the present. Um, and that had become a really comfortable rhythm for me. And so I tried to do that here too. Um, and that's how the outline was two in the past, or I think it started with the present chapter, but then two in the past, one in the present, two in the past, one in the present. Um, and that didn't work. We, we didn't, we didn't need to see present day Ava as much as, as much as I initially had in mind. Um, and so that changed, that actually was still in the first draft and my, my editor read it and was like, no, we've got to cut some of this out. Um, mm -hmm. and so I think I removed some of those chapters. I condensed a couple of them into like, you know, maybe three chapters became one or whatever. Um, and I think, I think, think there was more emphasis on the actual escape to Switzerland at the end than there was in the outline. I think that was something that changed. I think I developed that mm -hmm. as I went. But this was one of those books. This this one came to me really smoothly. Like some books do, some books don't. Um, this one, and by smoothly, I mean the outline kind of unfolded smoothly and made sense to me. And then when I sat down to write the book, it followed the outline pretty, 
pretty seamlessly. So there, there were not really big changes. I'm glad to hear that you didn't know who the um, who the trader was going to be at the beginning, because that was actually one of our questions that we probably oh, won't yeah. get to widely. But I certainly did not know who it was. I didn't either. I didn't. I was like, it didn't come to me until like, to the end. I wasn't sure if we could quite trust trust the guy Joseph, but I wouldn't have gone gone as far to think that he would have betrayed them like that. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, I always had it in my mind that he was going to be kind of, you know, like this like that you know that that guy you like when you're 20 the guy who's like not a great guy but he's the guy who's suave and makes you feel a little bit bad about yourself so like there must be something great about him you know what I mean like he was that exactly. guy and so yeah. and, and, and the guy who just the mom was like oh this guy's the best like you know yeah I like that and, how she thought he was about right yeah. but, right so like so it, mm -hmm. he became kind of a sticking point between you know when Ava was thinking I still want to please my mom he was a really good way to please her mom like it would have made her mom super happy if Ava had just been like yep Joseph's it like this is my man yeah. you know <laughs> um, but so so that kind of he I wanted him to serve that purpose um but I I didn't see until I was really into his character and again I can't remember whether it was the outline stage or the first draft I I didn't see that he was that that he that he needed to be the one who turned bad in, until mm -hmm. until I was into plotting him and into plotting the book that's really interesting and yeah, yeah I'm glad that you said that <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think uh, one person online says um, Brenda Gaskell says, I had a couple of different suspects not knowing made the reading more compelling. So that made it even more um, dramatic because we didn't know. And then someone thought it was Genevieve. Oh, that's, oh, that. that's, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. I think um, I would say that. That's interesting. It's, it's funny when people have said, oh, Shelly said that. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. I've, I've had a couple people say um, in reviews, like, uh, oh, I knew who it was from page one. And I'm like, well, good for you, because I didn't, you know? <laughs> I'm the one who wrote it. So, like, yeah, right? you're smarter than I am. You got it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Rita yeah. Pettis says, never did trust Joseph. Exactly. <laughs> it's like she knew, you're but she didn't trust right? him. He was you're that guy. Smooth, I thought. Yeah. He was, he was, yeah, he was too smooth. He was just too, but like, that didn't necessarily make him a bad guy it just made him a bad guy you know what I mean like not like not like the bad guy but just like maybe not a right. great dude you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. well I think I'm afraid that our time is just about up so I'm going to turn things over to Michelle but I hope that um our participants will um you know talk with each other when we're when we're finished with this and 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 communicate more with each other on the topics that we didn't get to cover so, and, and, I, and I'm happy to drop in this week and answer questions. I'm really sorry. I needed to, um, I, I have, I have been really bad about dropping into the page as often as I should. Um, this whole, since this book came out, time has just completely gotten away from me. And as we were talking about before we went on tonight, we've decided to keep my four-year-old home from school for now, um, just to kind of see how things go. Um, but that has also severely impacted the availability of my time. So, um, mm -hmm. so I'm just kind of trying to balance that, but I promise I'm going to drop onto the page and try to answer some stuff and interact. And I'm, I really do apologize for not being better about that already. Oh, you've been doing great, Kristen. Oh, I'm so sure. I'm sure yeah. our book club members have, have enjoyed the interaction they've had already. So if you get to drop in some more mm -hmm. and answer some of those other questions, I'm sure they'll be delighted. I, I, I really oh, will. And I, I, I should be, I should have been better about it all along and I'm sorry, but I, I will. You, I, I'll, I'll you be there. You don't have to apologize for that. I think <laughs> Thank, you. Really Absolutely Thank you. Absolutely not. Thank you. Okay. So I'm just, um, going to uh, close by saying uh, we thank all of you participants for attending our second session of the Friends and Fiction Book Club discussion, Kristen Harmel. Uh, Kristen, we thank you again for taking part in this with us, and we enjoy discovering more behind the amazing book of blessed names and your writing in general. So glad you were all able to attend this fabulous event. And as we were saying, if you have any other questions you weren't able to answer, I want to discuss the book. Uh, more, as Chris was saying, if you put them in the Friends and Fiction book club page, or even on the Friends and Fiction page, maybe she'll be able to answer some more of the questions. And we can even discuss it a little more on Wednesday 
I know we want to spend some time talking about the author who's coming on Wednesday, Christine McMorris, but we can also discuss it during our um, Wednesday 8 p.m. Zoom chat, too, if you like. Um, so our next uh, book discussion will be uh, next month, Monday, September 14th, also at 7 p.m. Oh, uh, Brenda has the book, <laughs> Arnold Boulevard. By, don't um, feel Katie bad. Allen, I got this. <laughs> no, I was like, I, I've, got, I've got the book here somewhere too. I'm like, where is it? <laughs> I have the book. Of there you go. There we go. The Ocean Boulevard. There we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it's next. It's Monday, September 14th at 7 p.m. And if you're interested in buying this book, if you don't have the book uh, on Ocean Boulevard yet, as uh, Fitz had mentioned before, this week's uh, book book sale is Copperfish Books in Punta Gorda, Florida. And they're offering a discount for this book and also any of the other new books from um, our Fab Five authors. Um, you can get 10% off a of paperback, 20% off a of hardcovers, and there's no code required. So um, this Wednesday's events include Wednesday at 7 p.m. Christina McMorris will be um, the guest speaker. Again, you can also order her book at the discount as well if you like. Um, so if you want to find out about ordering these books, there's a link in Friends and Fiction um, by Kristen and a, a link by me uh, in Friends and Fiction Book Club, but you can get more information and, and click on the link. So again, uh, thanks again, and you can order the book if you want for next month. Um, and it's a great way to get the book and support an indie bookstore. And thank you again, everyone. Have a good night. And also hope to see you uh, besides uh, the Wednesday regular chat seven our Wednesday Zoom um, book chat at 8 p.m. So thanks again. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, and thank you so much, Kristen. You were fabulous. We really appreciate you. Really you appreciate too, for doing here. all this. What a great chat. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks, Brendan. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.